Now this is a very occultic movie, and I want to get into all of the esoteric meaning, and I'm going to break down the entire movie. And I'm going to do so using contextual evidence, and I'm going to apply the esoteric meaning to the storyline as we go along. So I'm here to give you guys that information. It's up to you what you want to do with it, okay? Um, I do want to show that there's agendas present in these movies, and they're not always right on the surface. They're usually not buried very deep, though, guys. And the agenda here is very occultic and Gnostic. So let me get into what exactly do Gnostics believe about Lucifer and God? I don't have time to get into all of what Gnosticism is. That would be its own very long video. But I will say this. Gnosticism is not a kind of Christianity. Sometimes it is packaged in a way that makes it seem like a mystic kind of Christianity. It is not that. They do not believe that Jesus is the Savior. In fact, they believe Lucifer is the Savior of mankind, as we're about to see. I pulled these three short excerpts from the Forbidden Religion. Religion.com, and I'll read them really quickly to you. According to Gnostic legends and myth, the great unknowable God sent Lucifer, angel of indescribable fire and light, to show man the light and to help him wake up and see his true origin, the origin of his spirit, which has been perversely imprisoned in this impure matter called body-soul. So right there we see that Lucifer was sent to wake man up and basically to save him. I'll go on. Gnostics believe that this serpent, Lucifer, is the liberator of man in the world. It is wisdom, the liberating gnosis that wakes man up and saves him. Of course, this messenger of the unknowable god, Lucifer, is an opponent and an enemy of the creator of the world. Now obviously, the creator of the world is God. That's the Judeo-Christian God. So what do they believe about that God? Well, when we're talking about the creator of the world, we said that for Gnostics, the creator, the demiurge, the creator of matter, the universe, and man can be likened to Satan. Okay, guys? So there you have it. They believe that God is Satan. Since matter is satanic, and I'm quoting again, all creation is satanic, and the creator is a satanic being. So Christians get accused of saying that everything is satanic, right? And I'll admit, um, a lot of things are satanic, but Gnostics really believe that everything is satanic, literally, okay? They believe that all matter is satanic. Everything that was created is satanic. So that would be the whole universe for sure. Maybe the multiverse, right? Um, whatever's out there, pretty much, they believe it's satanic, other than this whole unknowable realm that is beyond that. And it's very interesting to me that they know about things that they call unknowable, because that seems like a huge contradiction. How can you have a god that is an unknowable god? How do you know of him? Um, yeah, that's pretty interesting. This creator oppresses man. Since the creation of man, he has forced him to carry out his orders and obey his precepts and commands. So, they believe that the God of this world, um, and actually not just this world, all of creation, the God, the creator God, let's say, um, or just God, um, since the other one's unknowable anyway, we can't know anything about him. Um, so God here, um, they believe that he's just made all these rules and laws to oppress us. That's very interesting to me. Now, say you have children and you make rules for them. Are you doing that just because you're an evil person? You hate them and you just want to hold them down and, you know, oppress them? Or are you doing it to prevent them from hurting themselves? Um, you're protecting them from danger and, and probably from hurting themselves, right? That's what a lot of rules are about. And, um, and people are kind of self-destructive. I mean, look around at your fellow man. You'll see them doing some pretty crazy stuff out there. So, um, this is really just like a five-year-old idea of religion to me, like the idea of a child, that God only makes these rules to oppress you, you know? I'm not saying that every rule out there is necessary. Sure, governments oppress people. That's kind of what they do by definition. But God, a good God, a just God, has to punish sin, right? He has to have rules. But it's also just that things need rules. I mean, we have to have some rules in society. We can't just have absolutely no rules. That would be madness, okay? So I think that their view of this is very immature. I think it's a child's view view of religion. And the other thing I would say about this is that I think it's very dangerous to call the world satanic, okay? Gnostics literally believe that the world is a matrix that God imprisoned us in. 
and that he has trapped our spirits within this matter and that is the matrix and the movie the matrix was an entirely gnostic movie and the character of the architect in the matrix was a direct representation of god and we're about to see another direct representation of god and we'll see that both characters are cold callous they're evil characters okay so right here i'm going to start the movie now so without further ado so this is the kingdom of mankind the first of the two kingdoms in the movie and we're told right away that there's a greedy evil oppressive king who lives in the castle that you were just looking at and he is a representation of god the god of the material universe and this represents the material universe the kingdom itself now as we move along we see that there's a second kingdom so as we're leaving the kingdom of man here the next kingdom you will see is the kingdom of magical creatures now the kingdom of magical creatures is definitely a parallel for the gnostic realm of the spirit so the realm of the spirit is something like the realm of the forms was to Plato. Now, they really like Plato, and they have used a lot of his stuff. They've redefined it with the word demiurge that was in the one of the quotations that I read just a moment ago comes right from Platonic philosophy. I think it's important to note that this is like the realm of the form. So, in other words, it's a place where things in and of themselves exist perfectly apart from this world. If this world was a painting of a landscape, for example, the landscape in and of itself would exist in a whole other place and we would just be in this cheap copy of it. Now in that place would exist landscape, the landscape in other words. We would have a landscape, a landscape here, a landscape there, there it exists in its purity. Now that is the idea of the realm of forms, and that is something like this Gnostic realm of the spirit. So without getting too drawn into all of that, we have this conflict of the two realms, the realm of matter and the realm of the spirit. Now we meet Maleficent. She's a cute little girl, and as we pan out, boom, we see this angel wings and devil horns. Now we also see these little fairies that she's playing with. They say that she's a fairy, and if you go to the Wikipedia for fairies, it explains now we think of fairies as tiny little people with little wings you know maybe six inches tall or so kind of like these guys right but in the olden days they had lots of different definitions of fairies and at one point almost any kind of magical creature was considered a fairy and one of the things that was considered a fairy were angelic like beings and you'll see that right in the wiki i think it's the second paragraph the other thing that they list are wizened trolls and we're about to see some trolls and i believe they represent demons in this movie now we also see that she has light in her hands which is why i paused the movie so right away angel wings devil horns i think the devil horns speak for themselves angel wings because lucifer was an angel and light because lucifer is the light bearer so she is definitely a representation of lucifer and we're going to see that more and more thoroughly as we go along it's going to become very clear so we see her using magic we actually see her using magic for good um she was using it to play right there but we're about to see her heal a tree so i find this interesting because um she is a good being we get an idea of her character right away and she's practically benevolent which is almost the opposite of her name her name is maleficent well if you look up maleficent it means Means evil and dangerous and it's practically an anonym for benevolent um, so it's interesting to see her as such a innocent character to me um, they were really going for a contrast here they're doing a complete character makeover and they actually say in the movie that she's a hero and a villain so um, here we see the demons I believe of course they're not bad either they're a little bit mischievous oh they threw some mud hits the guy in the eye you know it's all fun and games though so everybody is good everybody is happy this is nothing like the kingdom where the humans are oppressed by the terrible king we see in the realm of the spirit that everyone is free we also see a lot of flying which certainly represents freedom right here we see a real depiction of a paradise i think now the next major plot point is that she meets a little boy now i'm gonna spoil the plot right here the little boy represents jesus now he's going to become the next king the old king is not going to last too long in this movie and the boy is going to become the new king now the boy is his son and jesus is the son of god and the king who's currently king represents god thus the boy is jesus 
Also, the boy becomes king, and Jesus is the king of kings. So there are actually several parallels to Jesus, other than the sacrifice thing. We will not see this character make any sacrifices, and I will just go ahead and tell you that he is a terrible character. Um, he's a really, really bad guy in the end, and we'll see that that's their idea of the Christian Jesus. Gnostics do believe in Jesus, but they don't believe that he's a savior of the world. So. Moving along, we see that they become friends, and of course, before long, they fall in love, as people do in all Disney movies, right? Disney movies are constantly telling children that they need to run away, fall in love, get married to a prince or princess, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's all really interesting things to be telling little children, in my opinion. Um, not really sure that most Disney content is appropriate for children, as we're seeing already. But in any case, this to me is a clear depiction of Lucifer. Please try to put aside the fact that Lucifer is actually kissing Jesus right now. I do believe this is sacrilegious, by the way. But, um, we see the light behind them, and so we see, again, a light bearer image. We see the wings, and of course the devil horns. And this is definitely a depiction of Lucifer. So we're going to see more and more of those throughout this movie now they are sort of clever camera angles but they're more than that especially when you put them all together now what happens in the plot is that the boy sort of goes off and does his own thing and basically he's busy pursuing his own political power and ambition while Maleficent is being free as we can see here and she's become a powerful guardian of the magical creatures and their realm so, just going back a second here, we can see another Lucifer shot. This one is really clear. We can tell that this is an angel. It is in heaven. It has wings. The wings appear to be white in this shot, in fact. She actually has dark wings in the movie, but here they don't really look dark, do they? Lucifer is always depicted with white wings. So that is a very, not always, but it's a very common depiction. It also looks like the angel is glowing. And as I play this, it's actually going to look more like that, see? So this is a very obvious depiction of Lucifer. Now, I believe shots like this are in reference to the fact of this character becoming Satan. We see her in the mist, we see her in the shadows. It definitely foreshadows something in the plot, and I think that is the fall of Lucifer. Something very important. The king is now marching off into the land of the magical creatures, and he's basically crossing from one realm into another, and Lucifer is going to have to prevent this. Now, why would that be the case? If the material universe God, who created all of the material things, um, the cheap copies of the real things, if you will, if he were to march off into the land of the spirit, why would that be a bad thing? Well, he has a lot of power, and he's ignorant to think that he's only the first God, or the only God, and he's basically just very juvenile, according to the Gnostics. And because of that, he can't be allowed to just go off and do whatever he wants, or he could mess up all of existence. I think you'll see that all of these scenes go together and they make one solid storyline throughout this. Now we're about to see a battle of good and evil, but what I really want to point out first is that Lucifer wanted to be God. So in the Bible, we see that Lucifer fell because he exalted himself above God. He wanted to exalt his throne above all the stars of heaven and even God. So the Gnostics have given Lucifer exactly what he wants by making him a God. We'll see as this progresses that they really have a lot of love for Lucifer, almost as much as they have hate for God. So, we're about to see the war between Lucifer and the fallen angels versus Michael and the holy angels in heaven. So this is a depiction of good versus evil. In this depiction, we actually see God on the battlefield. Now that's not really described so much in the Bible, but we see something that's definitely not described in the Bible happen in this scene, and that is Lucifer actually mortally wounds God. Not only does she get a victory in this battle, but she actually mortally wounds the creator God. And this is incredibly satanic, guys. So this obviously cannot happen to an all-powerful god. But then again, the Gnostics do not believe that this god is all-powerful. So I'm skipping through the scene. Now here we see the Jesus character as he has grown up. And he is with the king in his chambers. The king is announcing to his council that whoever can kill Maleficent will become the next king. 
Now these guys are not going to even try to do that because they're not crazy enough to take on Maleficent, right? But this guy realizes that he's already gained her trust. He could go back and he could apologize to her and things could be like they were and then he could take advantage of her trust. And that's exactly what happens. Now, if you're thinking that's a very satanic thing to portray Jesus doing, yes, I would totally agree with you. So he shows up. Everything goes back to the way it was, like I said. He poisons her, and then he attempts to kill her. So he finds that he can't do it because, I don't know, maybe he loves her, maybe he just gets a guilty conscience, but he can't bring himself to do it. So he does something that's practically even worse. He actually cuts off her wings. Now, this is a terrible scene. I'm skipping it. And as you can see, this is her waking up with no wings. Now, I could think of a lot of parallels to this scene. Well, actually, I can only think of a couple. And I can tell you that neither one are appropriate for children, okay? If you see how distraught she looks, I think it's clear what this is a representation of. She's obviously in a lot of physical pain, but you see her really more mentally distraught, in my opinion, than in physical pain. Moving along, this is the fall of Lucifer. She has literally lost her wings. Jesus here is going to ride off with them in the cart and not give a crap about her, by the way, because that's exactly what his character is like in this movie. But she, on the other hand, is going to slowly pull herself together and she's going to sort of experience the darker side of her character. And that's going to lead her to becoming more Satan-like. Okay, Lucifer falls, and here we see her literally lose her wings. Meanwhile, he becomes the king, of course. So, this is the crow, her friend. She saved him. He's somewhat insular of a character. He's, he's a good character in the movie. He shows up throughout. But uh, the one thing I would point out about him, obviously he's a crow, so that is a satanic symbol, or a symbol of dark magic. And he has a crow's foot on his chest, the symbol of a crow's foot, which is an occultic symbol. And it's also a broken cross which goes perfectly with the plot of this movie, right? And uh, it's the same broken cross that you see in the peace sign, except it's upside down. The next thing that happens is we see her rolling over the magical creatures. So I believe this is her as Satan taking over and ruling over the other fallen angels and demons. So they don't look too happy about this, but she has all the power. And I think that's clearly how it was with Lucifer. He was the most powerful of the angels that he led in rebellion. And so after the rebellion and the fall, he still maintained control because well, that's how control works, right? The strongest person keeps their power until they're no longer the strongest person. I wanted to show this because this is the christening of the girl of sleeping beauty she has just been born aurora and to the jesus character of course the new king and um so it's a christening this is the first actual mention of any kind of a religious event in this movie i think it's significant that it's a christening because that's an actual christian thing right a christening I think that shows which side of the good versus evil this is. And if we look at it from a Gnostic point of view, Christianity is evil. So that will go along with the entire thing that I'm showing you guys. These are the fairies, the good fairies. Now, they were great characters in the cartoon, right? But in this movie, they're idiots, okay? They're like comic relief. They're weak. Um, Maleficent is constantly doing things to them and they can't fight back. They're just weak and um, inept, basically. Uh, practically powerless. So they represent the holy angels. Now this is important because Gnostics believe in archons. Basically any uh, spiritual being that would work for this um, silly, superficial, materialistic god must be an idiot, right? And they must be you know, a little twisted themselves. So they believe that the archons keep the knowledge from you. So the two things that the fairies could represent is a holy angel to a Christian or an archon to a Gnostic. And I would suggest that they are very, very similar things, but from two entirely opposite points of view as we see Gnosticism does have an entirely opposite point of view. So, this is important. This is the point where Lucifer actually meets mankind, or maybe it's even the idea of mankind. Maybe mankind is a soul disembodied, it's not put in human form yet, it's a little unclear. But, Satan here has fallen, and so 
she's jealous of mankind because mankind is being revered by this whole group everyone in the kingdom came to see even the fairies from the other kingdom came and she is not even invited to this and uh she's obviously not really happy with the guy who she was once in love with who now has a child from someone else so there are lots and lots of occult implications here we just saw the spinning wheel and if you noticed it was quick and i didn't pause it but they showed the um actual needle of the spinning wheel with a tiny point of light on it that's very important because the illumination represents knowledge to a gnostic so what we see there is the knowledge of sin and why that is important is because sin is going to be the curse now in the garden of eden the curse was sin and the wages of sin are death here it is and there's the point of light the illumination on this so this definitely represents knowledge because it is the light as we've seen that is knowledge to a gnostic the curse will bring about in the movie a death-like sleep and she has to prick her finger on this so she has to do it so it's very much like sin we have to sin it's not just something that happens to us right and our flesh causes it and we'll see that when the curse happens it's because her flesh activates and draws her into it so we're gonna see a lot of parallels here now if death and a death like sleep aren't basically the same thing i guess i don't know what it's right like what would better represent death than a death like sleep it's basically the same thing they just put it that way so they could tell children and little children wouldn't cry right so here we see her actually enact the curse so she's being quite devious and she actually puts the condition of the true love kiss as the only thing that can break the curse now that's very interesting to me because um the love of god in john 3 16 for example we see that the love of god god so loved the world that he sent his only son um is what saves us from the curse so here again love is the only thing that can save us from the curse and i think that's very very significant here we see an especially disturbing scene where jesus has now bowed to lucifer this is important because when jesus was tempted um satan actually said bow down before me and i will give you all of the kingdoms of the earth so we see him doing it here now he did not do that and he was tempted for you know 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness with no food no water and just barely alive the entire time satan was just barely keeping him alive so that he was at his weakest his flesh was completely broken and he was telling him if you just bow down before me i will stop all of this and i will make you a king over all the kingdoms of the earth and jesus still did not bow down to him here we see the king bow down to maleficent and this represents jesus bowing to satan and so that is a very anti-christian scene maleficent erects this barrier this represents the veil between the two realms and um, the veil is an occult idea by the way guys here we see that she's been sent off to live with the fairies that is aurora has now been sent off to live with the fairies we see that maleficent all of a sudden now that the plot between man aurora and the devil maleficent has begun she has scales around her horns and it's something that she wraps around her head and horns we're going to take a closer look at that in just a moment but this is definite snake imagery and she's very curious about this new um baby which represents the infancy of man when man is first created and the guardians are not doing a very good job in this uh garden of eden of sorts and uh therefore the snake is just right there right and uh they're just kind of too stupid to get it now here we see a crow the uh the man crow diablo i believe his name was in the cartoon i'm not sure if it's diablo in this or not but here he brings her a flower and he actually rocks her cradle with his crow foot so this is reinforcing to me hey satan loves you little baby don't forget and just in case you do forget it's reinforced a lot in this movie okay there's a lot of satan loves you scenes um <laughs> speaking of that just to tell you guys how twisted uh, a lot of luciferians are one luciferian in particular commented on something i said on the internet and his exact words were we're all lucifer's children 
And that's exactly how I pictured him saying it because he's a very creepy seeming dude. And um, yeah, that's that's what we're going for here. You know, we're all Lucifer's children. Satan loves you. Um, so here's mankind trying to burn through the veil because basically any obstacle that is put up against mankind, they will try to destroy, right? Um, it's kind of just the human nature. But here we see that it doesn't work. You can't just, you know, burn a magical barrier. So nothing happens essentially. The humans are driven back. Jesus is becoming very frustrated. The new king here, the representation of Jesus, is becoming obsessed with killing Maleficent. So he's now realizing his mistake in not killing her, and he's trying his best to do it. So um, this is a very important scene, and I want to go back just a tad. So they are in, more or less, another Garden of Eden parallel. That's what this entire part of the movie, section of the movie, represents, is the Garden of Eden. And that's what the song represented um, in the trailer that I played for you guys. But before I get back to that, let me explain this. So this is the cobra's head. You can see here, these are the things that um, you, you have at the top of a cobra's head and this is the actual head part in and of itself then you have well it's on her head so eyes nose mouth just like a cobra right so she is definitely representing a serpent at this point we also see these weird protruding cheekbones that are definitely not a human characteristic not only that but the neck is twisted around in a really weird way so we see it indents here it puffs out there it kind of looks like a snake swallowing an egg or something um, it's really, really friggin' weird, guys. And you have to admit that this is definite snake imagery, especially with the whole cobra head thing going on. The other thing we see here, and it's throughout this scene, uh, this is a very good shot of it, but it is throughout this scene. We see the light on this half of the face and the shadow on this half. Now, that's another thing that you could just write off as an interesting camera angle. However, with the one eye Illuminati symbolism, the typical Illuminati symbolism, we almost always see that the right eye is darkened. This actually comes from Zechariah in the Bible, and it's a quotation about the Antichrist and how he will have his right eye darkened, meaning blind. Blinded. Well, here we literally see the right eye darkened, and we also have this contrast of duality, which is very important to Gnostics. So we have the shadow and the light. They don't believe in a pure dualism because the unknowable God is far superior to the creator God in a Gnostic's opinion. So there is no pure dual battle but um, there is a form of duality so I should point that out now as we go through this scene we're going to see that this is where she becomes the protector of mankind Aurora so Aurora is running along on her own again no one's really looking out for her she's just allowed to do whatever and that leads to destruction right especially when you don't know any better so um, she uses her magic to save the girl here so she's starting to become her protector the fairies the holy angels are none the wiser because as I said they're inept so we can really see the scales there you can really see the snake imagery and she looks more and more inhuman with this cheekbone thing as the movie goes on I'm not sure if that's CGI or what it is so this is Lucifer in the garden and now this is where Aurora stumbles in and sees her she's checking out the horns and the scales if you notice so more of the human and snake imagery going on here um, she's not so sure what to do with Aurora and I think that's some commentary on Satan in the garden moving along so now she's playing with the crow the crow really takes a liking to her um, this is somewhat important so she's at the veil now um, when we were seeing her she was in the material realm so she's going towards the realm of the spirit and these soldiers are of course there to try to break through the veil and trying to kill Maleficent as um, that's all that the Jesus character is obsessed with now here's more of the shadow imagery so as we move through we're going to see something else that's very interesting she's bringing her through the veil now she's also done this by putting her into a deep sleep and levitating her and they're now in the kingdom of magical creatures which is a literal representation of the garden of eden it's a magical world where the normal rules of the world do not apply so that's a lot like the Garden of Eden. Man was immortal, and I should point out that the Gnostics believe that man was a slave in the Garden of Eden, and that Lucifer came along and woke him up, but in actuality, man could do anything except for sin, 
or eat of the tree of the knowledge of the fruit of good and evil, which would teach him what sin was. So in other words, he was superior to himself now in every way. Man was superior. Man was immortal for that matter. Um, here we see her still in the deep sleep. And this is important because in Genesis, God puts Adam into a deep sleep to remove his rib to create Eve. So we are seeing more of the imagery of the Garden of Eden take place here. She's letting her play with the you know, fairy beings, the light beings, whatever they represent. They could be fallen angels or something. It's very likely, actually. Um, I want to move along a little bit because here's where they meet. So she is not afraid of Maleficent and Maleficent thought that she would be. But the reason that she's not is because she doesn't understand the difference between good and evil. And that's exactly like Adam and Eve were before they ate of the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. They had no knowledge of good and evil. It's exactly as it sounds. I've got to skip along. Um, I mean, there's some things in this movie that are quite interesting. And if you're into occult imagery, there's really a lot of stuff. Uh, Maleficent tries to remove the curse, but of course she cannot because the curse is unremovable. They make that very clear in this movie. Once the curse is set in place, it cannot be stopped. So again, they're walking together. They've become really good friends at this point. God is really absent throughout that whole thing in the Garden of Eden, but Lucifer is there with man, and I think that's some really clear Gnostic commentary, that God is an absentee, he's off doing his own thing, he doesn't really care about you just so long as you're imprisoned in the physical world, right? This evil place, and um, you know, Lucifer is there for you. Again, Satan loves you. Don't forget, here they are again. Um, and she actually calls her a fairy godmother. And I think that is code for guardian angel. The more I thought about it, the more there's not really much of a difference between a guardian angel or a fairy godmother. They're these magical beings with wings and they can do all these sorts of things for you. They protect you, they grant your wishes. You know, it's, uh, it's practically the same thing. So here we go, she meets the boy. The boy is not very important at all in this movie. He's basically just there scenery he's just standing around um he's a total tool he doesn't really do anything to the um anything necessary to the plot at all he kisses her but it doesn't even wake her up from the curse i'm ruining the story again by the way he doesn't fight the dragon he doesn't do any of the stuff that he did in the cartoon and in fact he doesn't even go to the castle on his own maleficent brings him there and puts him like right in the girl's face and then all he does is the kiss and the kiss doesn't work so um yeah he's he's a total tool and he's just totally unimportant to the plot here now they have told her that she's cursed this is important she then goes to maleficent and confronts her this is the fall of man. Man now knows that man is cursed and that Satan or Lucifer was responsible for it. And she is about to flee from the garden as man was forced to do. So there are a couple of slight differences, but there are huge parallels again, okay? And when she runs off, she's going to go back to the material world, you know, the real world that we live in. Again, this is a parallel to Adam and Eve. So let me skip ahead. So she gets there and we see that the Jesus character, the new king, is not at all happy to see his daughter. He actually says, they brought you back too soon. What were they thinking? And then he says something along the lines of, I'm too busy for you. I have to plan my war. Go away. So she does exactly that. And he goes back to his obsession of killing Maleficent. Now I'm sure that's commentary on God and Jesus being obsessed with punishing Satan. She put the boy to sleep, and the horse is just kind of riding him to the castle. Um, now, her flesh is activating. So, um, we can see that there's magic in her finger. It's the curse of sin. We see her eyes change. So, there's nothing she can do to stop herself from activating the curse. Just as there is nothing man can do to stop himself from sinning. We see that the only person in the Bible who can stop themselves from sinning and who commits no sin is Jesus Christ. This whole idea of once you're a Christian, you will never commit a sin again is complete ridiculousness. Okay? Um, it couldn't be further from the truth. Of course you are going to sin. You're just a mortal human being. Okay? You don't have the power of a God. It would take the power of a God to not sin. Um... 
it's just the way it is guys so here we see the wheel actually puts itself back together with magic basically the curse is going to activate no matter what you do this is very important again i have explained to you guys already the curse and why the death versus a death like sleep right the wages of sin or death the death like sleep of the curse and the whole thing about sin but this is very interesting imagery we are again going to see the illumination on the actual needle. So this is the illumination of knowledge. It's not a coincidence that both times we see the needle, there's a single point of light illuminated on it. And here it is glowing so brightly that it's shining all over her face. It's lit up her face. So um, yeah, there's, there's no question that this represents the knowledge of sin and sin itself once she pricks it. So this is actual sin, and now she will die. Now, God said to Adam that in the day that you eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. And the serpent told Adam, you shall surely not die. You shall be as God, and your eyes shall be open. And Gnostics believe that the snake told the truth because Adam did not immediately die. But sin does cause death. So Adam was as good as dead the second he bit into the fruit. So Gnostics are entirely wrong there and they say that that's a proof that the snake was a good character and that the God of the Bible is an evil character, that we're misinterpreting it and that later parts of the Bible were rewritten to change the entire story. Now again, it's a little inconsistent to believe that some parts of the Bible were changed, most of it was kept the same, I mean <laughs> it's, it's a little unclear exactly what they believe and the Bible was not changed. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into this but there are 5600 copies of the bible the new testament that is in the original greek and those have been discovered throughout all different periods of time in all different countries if the bible had been changed they would all be totally different from one another they are not they agree with each other to a precision of 99.5 percent or slightly better so where they disagree, it's often such a thing as one copy says the Lord, another copy says Jesus, the next copy says the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are all essentially the same things, but that would be a disagreement in the text, and that would count in the 0.05% where the translations differ. Now, they do not differ on very many important points, okay? There are sometimes one copy here or there that has something slightly different, but you'll see that 90-something percent of the copies agree with each other on everything, okay? So there are not huge differences, and there would be, there's, there's a lot of other reasons why the Bible has not been changed guys the bible is the most historically authenticated ancient text in existence there are no other books that have anywhere near that many copies okay the next most uh copies of an ancient text is the iliad and it's way way less it's like five percent or less of the copies that we have of the new testament so most ancient texts that are considered to be very historically proven only have about six or seven copies okay not 5600 so moving along um we see the boy he's brought to the castle <laughs> again he's in the deep sleep so if she represents eve which is very possible then he would represent adam and the Gnostics wouldn't necessarily believe that uh, Adam was created first. It's really hard to say what a Gnostic would believe about that. That's one point that I'm not quite sure on. The boy finally gets in here, and the fairies find him. Now, the holy angels here believe that this is their plan, even though they're being duped entirely. Maleficent is controlling everything from behind the scenes. And again, Lucifer, guys. At least the Gnostic view of Lucifer. So he goes in for the kiss. Nothing happens. The fairies rush him away. Maleficent comes in because she's really sad now. It didn't work and she feels bad about cursing her. So she gives her the kiss on the forehead. And I saw this one coming a mile away, guys. Um, I was really disappointed in the plot right here. She wakes up, lo and behold, right? Um, Lucifer loves you. Again, this is a literal Lucifer loves you because it's the kiss of true love. It's true love's kiss, quote unquote, okay? So they're literally telling you that the devil loves mankind in this scene. Now, we have a couple more things to go, and this is the end of the movie. 
we see Maleficent is captured. Um, she has a weakness to iron, so they throw an iron net over her. This is significant because we're about to see the dragon, and this is a picture of Armageddon, in my opinion. The forces of good have captured Satan, okay? And in Revelation, we see Satan depicted as a great dragon. She turns the crow into a dragon right here. In the cartoon, she herself became a dragon, and I would go as far as to say that that her in the cartoon was a depiction of Satan as well. She um, said things like she commanded all the power of hell and she turned into a dragon and she had horns. Those are just a few of the things that make me say she was also the devil in the cartoon. Um, she was the mistress of evil and she had a crow named Diablo. I mean, I don't know how many more <laughs> contextual clues you would need to read into that, right? I mean, I'm a little bit of a writer, so uh, it's pretty obvious to me. If I wrote a character like that, I know what I would mean by it. Um, so here we go. Um, she's surrounded. Everything is looking very dark for Satan right here, right? Right? Lucifer is trapped. Um, the wings come back to life. Now, what we're about to see is the redemption of Lucifer, which is something that does not happen according to the Bible. Lucifer is done. It's over with. It's a done deal. Um, he is cursed to hell. Okay, so um, the only thing that's going to happen is he's going to be thrown into the bottomless pit. Then eventually he's going to be let out, but only so that he can be thrown into the lake of fire. Okay, so there's nothing positive about to happen to Lucifer or Satan in real life, which they're the same being, guys. Um, I should actually take a second to point that out. Gnostics will say that um, that we misinterpret the word Lucifer, that um, it was misinterpreted when it was written into the book of Isaiah. And the uh, it's not actually Lucifer in the Hebrew. That's a Greek translation. But the word that's translated as Lucifer is not put in there by accident, okay? We see that Satan was also an angel of light. He can still be an angel of light. He can appear as an angel of light according to Jesus. He fell from heaven as lightning according to Jesus. Lucifer was an angel of light who fell from heaven so this is not coincidence guys they'll also try to tell you that the part in revelations where um, christ is called the morning star they'll try to say that the morning star is the same as the sun of the morning which is a word for lucifer and they'll try to say jesus is lucifer this is satanic twisting of the text itself okay they're reading wrong information into scripture the sun of the morning is not the same as the morning star the sun of the morning is a title and the morning star is an entirely different title they don't sound all that alike in um hebrew or greek if you're making uh jesus Jesus into Lucifer by saying that Son of the Morning and Morning Star must be the same. Um, why? Because it has the word morning in it? I think that's about as far as you can go with that one. I think it's, it's about the most similar it gets, okay? So Jesus is about to kill Lucifer. Everything is looking really dark and then all of a sudden, I know I just ruined this because I already played it, but uh, the wings come back and this makes sense and we see the illumination so this is another lucifer shot guys lucifer is back is what they're saying and better than before there's more light than there was before we're about to see that the light is actually coming from her this time so there is no question that she is the light bearer and on top of all of that look at this look at the wings look at the clear depiction here of an angel i mean i don't think this can get any clearer at this point guys if you're not seeing lucifer here again the illumination the light the light all about her not just behind her so it's more than just clever camera angles guys um and just you know oh there happened to be some light we even see the light lighting up the dragon's face um yeah this this is just the return of lucifer the salvation and uh, redemption of Lucifer. And I think it had to do with the fact that um, he saved mankind. He saved Aurora from the sleep, which was death, okay? So he here is the savior of mankind, or she, Maleficent, is the savior of mankind. Depends on if you're looking at it as Lucifer or Maleficent, right? But I don't think there's anything too out of the ordinary with um, depicting Lucifer as a woman. I think angels are 
um, usually depicted as men in the Bible, but we don't know that all of them are men. And, uh, you know, th there could be effeminate men who are angels, or they've at least been depicted as that, right? Fair skin, fair complexion, and uh, relatively thin, like a Greek-type build. We've seen angels depicted as that for hundreds of years, you know, thousands of years, I suppose. Um, so right here is really important. He's hanging on to the chain because he's so obsessed with her, and because of that, he flies right through the window and um, he doesn't die yet, but she beats the crap out of him. OK, and not only does she win this fight. So Lucifer has victory over Jesus after Lucifer saves man. This is completely 100 percent backwards at this point. We've gone way beyond 360. We're spinning in three dimensions of backwardsness now. OK, so um, Jesus then attacks her after she was the bigger person and walked away. And because of that, he plummets to his death. And they show it in slow motion just to emphasize the fact, right? Because your subconscious is picking up a lot more of this than you might be picking up consciously if you watch the movie. I could see all of this consciously, but a person who has no background in this, um, they would pick up more subconsciously than consciously. Like right here, where we see the wings of Satan, the wings of death, basically descending upon the Jesus character. And what this is representing of course jesus defeated death jesus defeated satan by being crucified he broke the curse by being crucified and here we see death and satan descending upon him and having victory over him this is the most satanic scene out of the entire movie and that is really saying something okay guys so i'm gonna move on from this pretty quickly now what we see is the dawn right that's actually very significant because we're about to see the age of the golden dawn or the age of aquarius um take place or a lot what a lot of people are calling the fifth age now um None of those are biblical terms, of course. They all denote the Antichrist kingdom, and it's the view of an occultist of the Antichrist kingdom. So we have to be careful in using all those terms because they're not really correct. So we see the veil between the two worlds come down. That's very important because now the spirit is accessible to um, people. Humans are no longer stuck in the matter, the prison, the matrix, if you will, that was holding them to a Gnostic, of course. Now they are free in the spirit and they can be where all the magical creatures are. So we see the fairy swoop in, which means even the holy angels are welcome here. But we see that only if they respect the power of Lucifer. Now, you can't go into the New Age without your Luciferian initiation. That was actually stated by a member of the UN. So um, so that's what this is. We see she has the golden crown. This is definitely a depiction of the golden dawn. We could also say that this is a depiction of the Antichrist kingdom, which is actually a false kingdom. It's a false peace and a false prosperity, and it won't last very long. They're going to be saying, yeah, this will last forever, but it's only going to last for a few years. So um, so I want to move on really quickly. I think this is very significant, though. I mean, the new age happens and everyone lives happily ever after. This is certainly predictive programming because they want you to believe that at some point everything is going to become perfect. And also, this is how it's going to be. They want you to think that Satan or Lucifer is actually the god that will present this now um, that symbol on that rock is interesting to me it looks like a symbol for the solar system um, we can see it looks like a planet or it could be the sun um, or a moon and it looks like it's in its orbit like a, like a revolution I was just looking at that um, I hadn't really prepared to speak about that at all um, just noticing that as we're going so um, there's one last Lucifer shot that I want to show you guys, and then I have something slightly different. So the last shot of Lucifer, she flies away with the crow, and we see her go up through the clouds. It's very similar to the other shot that we saw in the beginning. Oh, and Lucifer has ascended, right? So that's what we're looking at, guys. Um, we saw the girl and the boy, even though the boy didn't really do anything, in the New Kingdom. So humanity is definitely in the New Kingdom with the magical creatures, which were representing um, demons, fallen angels. And we even see holy angels, as long as they're willing to give up being a holy angel and to follow Lucifer, of course. Now we see Lucifer goes up back to the heavens. So this is a 
another depiction of the redemption of Lucifer as an angel. So, and then, of course, they fly off into the sun because everybody rides off into a sunset or flies into the sun or something, right? That's just movies. So, uh, that's the movie, guys. I hope you followed all that. Um, I think it's a really clear Gnostic depiction of Lucifer and God. And we just saw that the evil... The hatred and revenge was actually God, it wasn't Lucifer. So that's part of the really disturbing message about this movie to me. Um, so we saw really all of the imagery that I thought about covering in the pictures. I think we got it all, except for this. Um, this was the slogan of the movie, Maleficent, evil has a beginning. So they're telling you that, you know, yeah, the you're, you're not really getting the story right. You know, you think Satan is the bad guy just because he's evil. But he's evil because he's really misunderstood. God did all these terrible things to him. And he's really been there in the background trying to help you this whole time. And so, you know, you really need to have some reverence and respect for Lucifer. And from this, guys, I didn't expect to see this in my research. And it's really disturbing to me. But this is the Maleficent Halloween costume. Now, it goes without saying that people are going to be this for Halloween just because it was such a popular movie, right? But I was really disturbed to see this. Um, Maleficent horns for playtime. Now, so, so this is not just one day a year. This is your daughter dressing up as the devil every day of the year, right? I mean, why restrict it? So, uh, yeah, who would send out their, you know, what is she, like 10? 10 year old girl without you know devil horns on what what parent would do that you must be mean to your kid if you're sending them out without their devil horns right she's basically a witch with devil horns yeah it's and here we see it again so this is just really really disturbing to me you know all these little girls with devil horns and people were making these um it's not like just one company makes them if you go online there's all these different people who made homemade maleficent devil horns and start selling them on the internet and uh, i actually looked at it because i was curious where all these girls were getting devil horns from so here we see like a five-year-old girl with uh fluffy devil horns this time and angel wings again um yep can't let your little girl go out without her being dressed as the devil and man i mean these horns are like bigger than she is what is going on that's why i had to check out where these horns were coming from i was like who, who was getting these horns where do they keep coming from um again just look at these cute little girls with <sighs> dressed up as the devil it's really it bothers me guys it really does if it doesn't bother you I'd, I'd question your judgment um here we go let's make them pink right the other ones <laughs> were a little too dark maybe for a lot of little girls so let's make them pink we'll put some sequins on it we'll put some frilly lace and you know girl it up for them so instead of them being you know princesses or playing little mermaid or whatever the other disney characters are they're now you know running around playing maleficent this is you know and it's all because of this so uh she was basically wearing like a burlap sack here so obviously little girls aren't dying to wear that right so hey make it pink make it black whatever you know or hey you don't even need the outfit just grab some wings and some horns and you can be the devil <sighs> so um yeah guys this was really disturbing to me I didn't expect to come across that in my research at all, so I just wanted to share that with you real quickly. So in conclusion, the movie Maleficent represents the story of Lucifer and God and mankind. And it tells it in a very, very, very backwards way where Lucifer is the absolute hero. Lucifer redeems man, saves man from sin and from God, wakes man up with the knowledge, the gnosis, and is then redeemed himself. The way that the wings came back, we saw that something more was going on that wasn't explained in the basic plot so this is entirely gnostic and satanic in actuality god is not out to get you the devil is not here to help you you are not being oppressed by god's laws they are here to protect you they are especially here to protect you from hurting yourself and other people all right guys peace god bless